Cast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello everyone, good morning and good afternoon, and welcome to the webinar, Produce High Risk Adjusted Returns with Quantified New Sentiment and Daily Stock Loan Data, co-hosted by Data Explorers and Ravenpack News Analytics. In today's webinar, Dr. John Cottrell of Knightsbridge Asset Management will present his analysis of new sentiment and stock lending signals in the U.S. equity market between 2007 and 2010, as outlined in his forthcoming research paper, Behavioral Trends and Market Neutrality. Following his presentation, Sam Pearson of Data Explorers will interview Dr. Cottrell, and we will open the discussion to audience questions. Until then, please know that the phone lines have been muted to cut down on external noise, so if you wish to pose a question during the presentation, please use the question box at the bottom of your GoToWebinar toolbar. We will try our best to answer all questions before the end of the webinar, and we'll email responses to those we may miss. And now, without further ado, I'd like to present Dr. John Cottrell. Over to you, John. Thanks, Erica. Well, hello, everyone from far and wide, hither and yon. This is John Cottrell speaking from Knightsbridge Asset Management in Newport Beach, California. The following presentation is based on a working paper of mine entitled Behavioral Trends and Market Neutrality. The research is still somewhat of a work in progress, and these are but a few preliminary results. I'll indicate in the course of the presentation the parts that are still under construction. In any case, hopefully this will be a good practical illustration of how to invest using the relatively untapped data sources of news and short selling. So to start, let me give you a big picture version. The main goal is to build absolute returning long short equity strategies from machine readable news and stock lending volume. I'll be working in a large cap, very liquid universe of US securities, namely the largest 500 securities in CRIS. My intention is to build standalone news-based and lending-based strategies, then to integrate the two into hybrid strategies, as illustrated in the Venn diagram here. To summarize the final results, using news alone, the strategies will return 20% annualized in excess of the market. Using lending data alone, strategies will return 25% annualized excess. Then to top it off, hybrid strategies will yield 30%. So I hope that whets your appetite somewhat. Let me briefly discuss the behavioral rationale behind my strategy. The principle of scientific induction, which states the future will be like the past, asserts a certain regularity within nature. In a sense, it's really a statement about causality. Past effects will obtain in the future because their causes will. The sun will rise tomorrow, for example, because the planets will still be in orbit tomorrow. Financial markets, on the other hand, are far from regular. Back-tested performance should be expected to repeat if there's sufficient reason to believe that the cause will, but this is not always clear. Financial causality is wildly different from natural causality. At the most fundamental level, prices move because of human behavior, decisions to buy and sell. Behavior, therefore, is what should be central in a strategy. My own personal mantra is to trade on the cause, not the effect. This is in contrast with, say, a momentum strategy that simply follows the effects of behavior and disregards the question of causality. In order to predict behavior, then, we must understand the notion of sentiment. Modular sophisticated quant trading, the vast majority of investing in the stock market is motivated by emotion, such as fear and greed. Successful investors have the marked ability to control their emotions. You might say that they have a sort of emotional intelligence. This leads to a distinction. Informed or intelligent sentiment can be discerned in the behavior of people such as short sellers and insiders. Put another way, the smart money. On the other hand, uninformed or unintelligent sentiment can be measured via media exuberance, where investors exhibit herd-like behavior around attention-grabbing stocks. We shall take advantage of this type of behavior by isolating stocks experiencing abnormal levels of media coverage and short selling. Positions and weights shall dynamically evolve with changes in sentiment, so when sentimental tipping points have been reached, our portfolios will be optimally postured to benefit from the behavior that follows. The optimal hybrid strategy shall use media sentiment to identify areas of the market that are exhibiting herd-like behavior and then from within following the trading trends of short sellers. Recent academic work on news and short selling supports our hypothesis that short sellers are superior interpreters of news content. They trade correctly around information-intense 
sentiment-driven environment. The issue with implementing such findings is the nature of the data sources used. Academics are not too concerned with trading, but we are. Hence, only data that is available on a daily basis through commercial products shall be used. Archives are point in time, non-survivor bias, and go back four years. The stock lending data comes from Data Explorers, a company that tracks daily data pertaining to institutional fund flow, loan availability, and lending volume, as provided by the lenders and borrowers themselves. Our news analytics comes from the company Ravenpack. They specialize in transforming the unstructured text of news stories instantaneously via their algorithms into actionable data delivered within milliseconds of publication to their end clients. Sentiment is quantified to simulate the reaction of professional analysts to financial news. More will be said on these two data sets in the next two sections. In order to ensure liquidity and minimize transaction costs, we restrict our attention to the largest 500 securities in CRISP which is effectively the S&P 500 universe. You can see that the quarterly cap-weighted returns of our master universe just replicates the S&P return. Notice the large downward spikes, such as in Q4 2008. This is what we want to avoid by designing loss-averse strategies. Indeed, we'll look to actually profit from these emotional sell-offs. As for portfolio detail, strategies will be 150-50, so 50% short exposure to the size of the fund, no position weight shall exceed a tenth. If one does, a trimming algorithm is performed and excess, ex, excess weight is redistributed among lighter positions in order of precedence. Portfolios will be designed to optimize returns and minimize the downside. And we won't short stocks during the 2008 ban, at least those names were banned. Portfolios will be daily rebalanced at the open. Why? On the one hand, Data Explorers update their data at midnight UTC or 8 p.m. East Coast time, so the earliest chance for us to trade on it is at the open. Also, news analytics measurements are made one minute before the market opens in order to make the strategies nimble enough to take advantage of events that occur before the market opens. For example, the Commerce Department announced a week or so ago before the open an unexpected rise in the GDP. Obviously, the subsequent trading over the course of the day was motivated by this new development. If you object to trading at the open, recall that our master universe is very liquid. The uptick rule was never reinstated, so it shouldn't be an issue shorting on the opening tick. The question of dividends has been a slight sore point for me in the course of this work, as indicated in the blood red font. A realistic simulation should reinvest or repay in the case of borrowing dividends on the payment date, not the X date. You could be recorded as a shareholder on the X date, yet not receive the dividend payment for multiple weeks. But now that I think of it, I guess you could just keep some cash reserves and reinvest or repay on the X date as if you were responsible for the dividend payment then. In any case, this is something I'm still working on. For the present, dividends can be ignored by using open to close prices. You have to own a stock at the close of the trading day before the X date to be considered a shareholder. You might wonder what you're missing by excluding returns after hours. I claim that this is beside the point, really. Assume that you do lose some significant performance after hours trade from after hours trading, then just neutralize your after hours exposure. I'm sure there are fancier, more cost efficient ways to do this using derivatives, but here's a brute force approach. First, sell your long positions at the close and buy them back at the open. Bear with me for a moment and I'll address transaction costs in a second. Then go along the positions in your short portfolio and sell them back at the open and you're done. Or, or you don't even have to do that. I guess there's no borrowing costs uh, shorting stocks from open to close anyway. Um, no adjustment to short positions is required. So if you have 100 stocks in both long and short portfolios, this comes to around 200 transactions per day. If say you paid $7 in commission per transaction, I think this is what we pay Fidelity, then uh, $1,400 a day is what you pay. Uh, over 250 trading days, that's $350,000. If you had $100 million in the strategy, that's about 35 basis points per year hedging after hours expo exposure. The upside is that when you hedged your short exposure, or if, if you chose to do it this way, you bought some stocks at the close. So guess what? You could get some dividends, probably adding, I don't know, 100 basis points per year and plenty to cover the transaction costs. Anyway, all that being said, I plan to look at dividend adjusted returns in the full-fledged paper in addition to what happens when holding periods are extended beyond the day. 
One more quick de detail on mechanics. The strategies are intended to be more high frequency and adapt quickly to behavioral trends. For the purpose of illustration, let's look at turnover in the 100 stock hybrid strategy. On a daily basis, 8% of the value of the fund is trading, not including selling and buying back borrowed securities. On the other hand, 7% of the value of the fund must be borrowed on a daily basis. So if again you're running 100 million, 8 million must be net bought sold, and 7 million must be borrowed shorted on a daily basis. If this is unacceptable, you could always establish trading rules and lower the turnover. I'm in the process of designing sensitivity tests that show just what effect the minimizing of turnover has on performance. Again, the paper should address the issue more fully. But enough with the tedious details. Let's take a step back and conclude the intro by again contemplating the big picture. So here we are, surveying the landscape of our glorious master universe. The idea is to sort of reshuffle our opportunity set. Using whatever sentiment metric is in hand, we segment the market into out of favor and in favor pieces. Next comes the key step. In order to fully take advantage of the delayed behavior in these areas of the market, we reweight each position according to its relative contribution to total sentiment. Hence, in the out of favor subset, we might be heavily weighting B of A around the time of all the write downs or forward when its future was in jeopardy all the while lightly weighting stocks that are just slightly out of favor. Reshuffle, reweight, and relax. Another motto I invented especially for this occasion. I like to think of the strategies as sequence, uh, sequences of sort of psychological snapshots. Perhaps say that the portfolios reflect in investment terms, aggregate investor burning in the bosom. I find the intuition behind news-based strategies to be particularly attractive. Follow me through an example. Take your average money manager, Joe. Joe owns company X in his portfolio. Given that Joe has been in business for as long as he has, it can be assumed that he's relatively smart. Indeed, Joe fancies himself to be so. He bought X, thoroughly convinced that its price would go up. What if then X has a pretty bad quarter? A steady stream of negativity comes to the news wires, an earnings loss, a factory closes. Our short portfolio ramps up its exposure to X as a result. Yet Joe is undeterred. Remember that Joe is smart, and he doesn't like to be overreactive. He notes some positive news about X, perhaps some favorable government regulations with an excess industry. So Joe holds on to X. Then analysts start getting very unhappy. X finds itself in huge amounts of debt. Joe feels that familiar lump in his throat. Finally, Moody's downgrades X to B1 speculative grade. Joe has to sell X now. Indeed, he's not even allowed to hold speculative grade stocks in his portfolio. All the while, our portfolio has built up its short exposure to the X and is in the perfect position to reap the maximum benefit from the selling pressure exerted by Joe and all the other Joes like him. So that sort of in a nutshell describes the behavioral trends that the strategies are intending to follow. So now let's, let's step into the details a bit, starting with lending-based strategies. The securities lending market is somewhat opaque, it being not a market per se, but more a network of participants who are only required to disclose their transactions twice a month. In order to get real-time information on such transactions, Data Explorers has established relationships with the investment banks, prime brokers, beneficial owners, and hedge funds that constitute the lending market. Part of subscribing to the Data Explorers feed is that you must, must contribute to the data yourself by disclosing your own lending or borrowing practices. Bringing it all together, we now have daily data on the number of, da of shares that are on loan and the number of shares that are available to loan. They also provide a proprietary metric that measures the cost of borrowing a security, known as the DCBS score. We require DCBS to be one, meaning our securities are as cheap to borrow as possible. With data explorers covering roughly 90% of all securities, this leaves us with a subset of our master universe numbering around 400 to 450 stocks with DCBS equal to one. Before getting into the strategies, let me make a few obvious definitions. The demand, which I'll denote delta for security on a given day, is the total number of its shares that are out on loan as reported on that day. The inventory denoted iota is the number of shares that are available to borrow, including those that are on loan. Finally, the utilization, denoted upsilon, is the demand over the inventory. The strategies will be constructed as a function of portfolio size, 
say n less than or equal to 100. To note the long and the short portfolio is lambda and sigma, respectively. Let's start with sigma. In our master universe, take the subset with DCBS equal to 1 and order it by descending utilization. Take the largest n securities in its ordering and add them to sigma. Each member of sigma is then weighted according to its contribution to the total demand of all sigma securities. In particular, if T sigma is the summation of all the demand values of members of sigma, the weight of a particular member of sigma is its demand divided by T sigma. So essentially, the short portfolio consists of the securities that are the most heavily shorted, and each position size is determined by the relative contribution a security makes to the total demand or aggregate short sentiment. The long portfolio is the mirror image of the short. Instead of the largest n securities in the utilization ordering, take the n smallest, then weight by iota minus delta, or the non-utilized inventory. In effect, the stocks with the lightest shorting are weighted the most. I would remark that this isn't an ideal long strategy. If the market's going up, light shorting doesn't seem like the best buy signal. It would tell you in such a case that at least the security isn't going down. I simply wanted to build strategies using lending data alone. If you want to capitalize on this notion of informed sentiment in the market, you might try incorporating some insider buying into your strategy. Here then are the returns of these strategies as a function of portfolio size. The black line records the four-year annualized return for each strategy. The dark blue line is the worst quarterly absolute return, or the maximum drawdown, and the light blue line is the second worst quarterly return. Observe an annualized return of 25% for portfolios of size 20 to 70. The annualized market return over the same period is just below zero, hence the alpha is pretty significant. On the other hand, the maximum drawdown for these portfolios is stuck around negative 10%. Given the worst returning quarter for the market was negative 23%, this is still fantastic, but we could make some improvements. Next, we'll design market-neutral strategies based purely on new sentiments. The diagram here illustrates the Raven Pack workflow. It can be thought of as a sort of information refinery. The raw materials come from unstructured news items, news flashes, articles, whatever comes through the news wires in text form. Raven Pack then feeds this data into the proprietary software and extracts meaningful sentiment information via natural language processing algorithms, then outputs the results within milliseconds. The heavy lifting being done it should be remarked that this data is still fairly noisy. For a given company, how exactly do you measure its sentiment? Raven Pack provides a data feed containing news items and analytics, but where do we go from there? News is not as uniform and consistent as other sources of financial data. There must be some further aggregation process in order to turn the data into investment signals. The atomic building blocks of our new sentiment measurements will be the so-called composite sentiment scores. The CSS is based on subject matter. For example, if the story is about an analyst downgrade, an earnings announcement, or both. Linguistic tone, is the language meant to stir the emotion? And the potential effect the content could have on future price and volume, or mar market response. This has more to do with the AI machine learning dimension to the technology. Scores are positive, negative, or neutral, and there are even gradations within these categories. However, we simply stick to positive and negative. We also set the Raven Pack relevance score uh, at the highest value. Typically, it's also important to sort for novelty. However, we leave this field alone. It could be that a particular event causes a glut of news coverage, and our strategies will want to pick up on it. Here then are a few more technical definitions. For fixed company, trading day, and look back window, we define the number of positive and the number of negative news stories over the look back period as new positive one and new negative one, respectively. There's nothing deep going on here. It's just some bookkeeping. From these two news, we then define two sentiment ratios. Given a fixed company, trading day, and look back window, the positive news ratio denoted row positive one is the ratio of the number of positive news stories to the total number of news stories about the company on the given day over the look back. The negative news ratio, denoted row negative one, 
is the ratio of the number of negative news stories to the total number of news stories about the company on the given day over the look back. Clearly, these ratios are intended to indicate relative amounts of sentiment at the company level. Aggregating sentiment in this way has the virtue of making two different companies comparable, although they might experience very different volumes of news. As in the strategy construction in the previous section, we fix the portfolio size and describe the positions and weights of the long and short portfolios lambda and sigma. The process again follows a kind of magnification in which areas of the market are isolated as exemplifying a particular kind of behavior. Then positions are weighted according to the relative degree a given company is an exemplar of that behavior. Moreover, we shall fix on a look back aggregation period of one month. To start with Lambda, order all companies in our master universe with non-trivial positive sentiment measurements by descending positive sentiment ratios. These are the companies that are the most in favor in the media over the previous month. Weight each member of Lambda by the ratio of the number of its positive stories to the total number of positive stories about Lambda companies. The idea is analogous to the previous section this time emphasizing positions that have the largest contribution of positivity to the in-favor market segment. Then build sigma in the same way, only using negative stories and negative sentiment ratios. Here are the returns of our news-based strategies as a function of portfolio size. Although our best performers are around 20% instead of 25%, our risk profile has improved. Notice the autocorrelation as portfolio size increases. This seems to indicate that the best way to take advantage of media sentiment is to segment the market into larger pieces. This is fairly intuitive. If indeed we're taking advantage of herd behavior, we should expect to spread our investments over enough of the market to encompass the herd wherever it might be grazing. Finally, we come to hybrid strategies. This takes us back to our original erudite discussion of causality. We had a hypothesis about two different types of sentiment and how they motivate two different types of behavior. The both factors make for good standalone strategies that yield high risk-adjusted returns. The virtue of combining them into new strategies lies primarily in the reasonableness of doing so. If the intelligence of short sellers is displayed in the correct interpretation of publicly available information, then they should be good guides through information intense situations. Instead of a detailed account of the strategies, we use broad brush strokes. Start us in the new sentiment strategy by identifying market segments experiencing extreme levels of sentimental media coverage over the preceding month. Within the out of favor universe, select the companies with the highest lending utilization. Within the in favor universe, select the companies with the lowest utilization. Finally, weight position sizes by demand and lending availability. Et voila! The same autocorrelation occurs as in the news-based strategy, while the annualized return is pushed up to 30%. Moreover, a comparable risk profile is maintained. In particular, as we get out to 100 stock portfolios, the four-year annualized return is around 30%. The worst quarter quarterly absolute return is around negative 5%, and the second worst is around negative 3%. Quite nice, if you ask me. All right, let me just run through a few quick uh, examples of position weights for particular securities. This is Goldman Sachs, and the dark blue line is, is the weight uh, uh, of the short portfolio, and the light blue line is the weight in, in the, in the uh, long portfolio. You can see around the time of the credit crisis, that Goldman is getting pretty heavily weighted in the short portfolio, obvious for obvious reasons. Um, and then in October 2008, there's this big gap, which is clearly the short selling ban. Um, also notice that it gets full weight of uh, 10% around uh, the time that the SEC was uh, taking action against, that, against them over the abacus issue. Um, you might be tempted to think that the larger the cap, the heavier the weight. Here's a counterexample. This is Exxon Mobil, and Exxon never receives full weight in either the long or the short portfolio, even though it's a mega, 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 mega cap stock. Um, this, this highlights the fact that we're really taking a step back from the traditional value weight um, and really just kind of reshuffling and reweighting in 
in this purely behavioral sort of way. Here's another interesting example. This is IBM, and th it's interesting from the point of view of uh, a stock that rarely gets included in the short portfolio, but is pretty consistently a member of the long and at a pretty good significant weight. And you can see that it, it kind of goes in and out, uh, at in for one month, out for a couple months, in for another month. Uh, it's maybe kind of cyclical, flight to quality sort of thing going on. I'm, I'm not sure, but interesting nonetheless. Here's a, a smaller financial name, Morgan Stanley. This is uh, interesting from the point of view that it does get fully weighted every now and then, once in the, the long portfolio and then another time in the short portfolio. And I think the capitalization of Morgan Stanley right now is, what, 20 billion? So clearly there's, there's um, not a whole lot of correlation between value weight. This is General Electric. It's an example of a stock that gets pretty heavily weighted uh, consistently and even at the, the full weight. You can see that uh, for most of 2008, it's pretty heavily weighted in the short portfolio. Uh, just a couple more quick examples. This is uh, uh, an example of a very lightly weighted stock in the long portfolio, Colgate. But even though it's light, lightly weighted, it's pretty consistent. And then finally, a smaller financial name, Capital One, that's lightly yet consistently weighted in the short portfolio. In conclusion, here are all three strategies in their optimal incarnations lined up against each other from quarter to quarter. The first column is the cap-weighted return of our master universe. I would simply like to draw your attention to some of the worst performing quarters of the market, such as 2008, Q1, and Q4. What we see is the combination of lending and news yielding much better performance in hybrid form than either of the standalone strategies. This strongly supports our hypothesis that in highly sentiment-driven environments, particularly negative ones, short sellers are making the best decisions within the most sentimental market segments. And that's it. Great. Thanks very much, John. Um, we already have had quite a few questions coming in from the audience, but before we address those, I'd like to introduce Sam Pearson, Quantitative Product Specialist at Data Explorers, to continue the discussion with you. Sam, over to you. All right. Thank you. Um, John, just a couple of questions first about uh, the data sets that you're looking at. Uh, so firstly, in the uh, Raven Pack section where you referred to the novelty tags uh, on the stories, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that and how that might have uh, improved results getting a you know, more granular level of detail on those. For sure. Yeah. Raven, Pack, Raven Pack actually provides two novelty scores. One is is at the analytics level that is, is purely a Raven Pack tag, and then there's another one which is at an editorial level, which comes through the actual uh, uh, news, news wires. Um, the, the ENS, the event novelty score, which is the, the analytics level uh, tag, is, is, is what is typically screened for, and that's, that's mostly um, uh, getting at stories that occur on the same day. So um, if, if a, a story comes out about um, a layoff in, in a company and then another, another author picks up the same story, uh, th that second story will, will get tagged with um, a lower uh, novelty score. And, and my point in, in constructing these strategies was to uh, include everything. As I said, um, I, want, I want these, these instances where there's a glut of news coverage to actually get picked up in the strategies because that can be advantageous. It's an indication of, of some real overreaction or at least predicting some overreaction um, on, on the, in, in the shareholder base of whatever company uh, is tagged. So um, yeah, you, you, can get, you can get into a lot more granularity uh, um, with this data. This, this is just a kind of first, first uh, chance kind of uh, look, look at what, what you can do with it. Right. Um, and did you look at any of the other, like, at kind of segmenting out the different types of news? Um, or, you know, do you have any thoughts on, in terms of, you know, isolating, uh, you know, specific kind of text, uh, you know, something with a bankruptcy or, you know, something that's particularly negative or positive? You know, I, no, I didn't. I did not. But, but this, this highlights a very good point, namely that 
RavenMax does provide event-based tagging, so you, you can actually put together your own list of, of events and, and screen only for them if, if you, you didn't think uh, supply buy-sell in, imbalances was, was a good uh, event to be tagged as, as a, a negative news story. You can just screen those out. You can, you can just look at bankruptcies. You can just look at insider buying. You can just look at whatever. I think they have 300, 400 uh, events that they tag. So that, that could be a, a useful way to improve the strategies. <clears throat> I'd, also, I'd also like to, to point out that um, you know, the, the, the sentiment tags, the composite sentiment scores are, are values in between 0 and 100. And if, if you get tagged at 50, that's neutral. And then there are these gradations. So, so extremely negative uh, news stories will get even lower values of CSS, and, and extremely positive stories will get even higher values of CSS. And you might have noticed in, in the construction of the strategies, I kind of weighted everything according to the CSS values and in a very blunt sort of way, just like assigning one and a negative one to positive and negative. But you can get even more in, into even more granularity. Um, so that, that might improve things quite a bit, I think. Probably good next step. Interesting. Um, and then, in regards to the uh, Data Explorer securities lending data, um, you you left out the expensive to borrow securities by only including the cost score one. And do you have a view on uh, what leaving those in, you know, what effect that would have had, um, and and in kind of efficacy for being able to short them, you know, on a longer rebalance cycle? Yeah, I mean, I I imagine including them would in, improve on the short side uh, because if a, a security is hard to borrow, it's probably because lots of people are shorting it. Um, but uh, the, the other point being that since these returns are from open to close and you're shorting the stocks from open to close, you really don't have to pay borrowing costs. costs. And you could probably even hide, speak more onto that, on that subject than I could. But um, uh, yeah, so perhaps, perhaps also on the long side, I just haven't looked at it. So there are some issues with, with the, the actual raw data coming through data explorers itself. Sometimes securities can get tagged with either uh, um, uh, DCBS equal to one or, or non-one, uh, or greater than one. Uh, so yeah, it just, it just gets kind of complicated. But this, this at least makes, makes the, the universe as liquid and easy to borrow and uh, actionable as possible, which was the, the main goal. Right. And then, um in terms of expanding the universe beyond looking at kind of the mega caps, uh, I think the you know the purpose for that was just kind of maximum e efficacy in in executing this strategy. Um, but do you have a view on kind of what that would mean uh, expanding the universe further? Um, yeah, I, I mean obviously there there there, there are all kinds of uh, opportunities to to um, use different universes of stocks, not not just within U.S. securities but outside the U.S. and uh, maybe, yeah, maybe smaller cap names uh, work work better. Even you know, or maybe there there are some cycles when when these types of behavioral uh, things are 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 more are more pronounced in smaller cap names than larger cap. The, the the whole motivation for for doing doing it this way and looking at really really large cap stocks was, I I, I first of all I, I wanted to build like an index, a kind of uh, sentiment index. I'm I'm using the word portfolio instead of index for, for whatever reason, but you know the the whole the whole uh, ideology of weighting stocks by market cap is is kind of arbitrary. You know um, why why use market cap? It's it you you could use anything. You could use fundamentals. Um, some people do, but I I don't think people have really explored this this type of approach where you're you're weighting purely on behavior. And, and you'll notice that in all of all of those definitions, whether in, in lending-based strategies or news-based strategies, I I, I use pri I never use price. Um, <laughs> so uh, there are the, some of those examples as well that illustrate the fact that you know uh, really really mega cap stocks like Exxon aren't getting full fully weighted, yet smaller cap stocks like Morgan Stanley are getting fully weighted at times. And it's just it's just an indication of of behavior as opposed to uh, you know the just size of the company, and I think that's a good thing. And yeah, and just further that on the um, position sizing piece, 
Do you have a view on how much the returns are being dictated by the uh, position sizing mechanism, or what? I think that I think they are getting dictated quite a bit. I, I did I did look at value um, initially, and and the returns weren't nearly as good. Or I and by nearly as good, I mean you <laughs> approximate approximate more closely the the market return, obviously because it's it's a cap weighted sort of return. So um, I think the behavioral weighting is really the key step in in the whole process. And uh, yeah, as as the, the the example that I discussed earlier sort of, sort of illustrates, you're 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 building up the position in order to to take advantage of of this delayed behavior effect, so that you know it, it, you could have delayed behavior out of favor in favor sentiment in the market, regardless of of the the cap size. Um, most of these things can be you know industry based. Uh, um, out of favor, in favor industries, you could find your stocks being being very uh, localized in, in these particular areas. But why why are you looking at cap? I mean, it doesn't. It, there's no there's no particular reason I think to look at cap. Um, that's just my own philosophy. Right. Um, and do you have a view on what kind of just equal sizing would look like, um, or and or further that kind of the uh, just the bias towards the 150-50, um, you know, whether kind of modif how big a difference in returns modification to that uh, basic constraint would make? I have not looked at um, equal weighting just because it seemed uh, too simplistic, I guess. <laughs> um, uh, but as far as the 150-50, I'm sorry, I didn't follow you exactly. I was just saying in terms of, you know, the overall returns, like how much they're uh, dependent on that kind of, on that constraint um, or what oh, yeah, kind of sure, sure. ratings might look like? Sure, of course, yeah. I mean, the, the 150-50 part, I think, is, is, is important as well because really, uh, particularly in the, the, the hybrid strategies, we're, we're, we're leveraging the behavior of short sellers, right? So a good, sizable short exposure is, is, is the best thing. And I, I, I did run, you know, like 130-30 strategies as well. And even though the returns were great, they weren't as good as 150-50. No, the whole idea is to take take advantage of this informed behavior of, of short sellers and how do you leverage that uh, as much as possible. Oh, and I just wanted to move back a question um, and make a comment in response to a comment from one of our guests, which is on the uh, DCBS, the cost to borrow score. So just to clarify from Data Explorers, we have uh, two different products on that, which are uh, the 1 to 10 cost to borrow score, and then also a few 0 to 5 scores that represent different date ranges. So for uh, what John's talking about with the uh, cheapest bucket being 1, that's the 1 to 10 score. So I just wanted to clarify that. Um, So I, I, one, another question that we had uh, is in terms of volatility of returns. So I don't know if there's something you could say about uh, you know, where you're reporting the quarterly returns here, how volatile the daily returns are. Yeah, actually, I do have some numbers for you. Uh, let's see. If you just if you just want to take a straight average, equal weighted average of daily returns, um, and if you, you you take the the, the average of all da daily returns over this this particular back-tested period, um, for the market you get zero, zero basis points flat. And the standard deviation is, is around 140 basis points. For the strategy, you average all the daily rep returns and get 11 basis points. And the standard deviation is around 70 basis points. So that means you're, I mean, obviously uh, you're getting a lot of uh, alpha there, but um, you're literally having the, the volatility of the market in, in the hybrid strategy. Oh, and then on, on the last point with the, uh, the uh, portfolio construction with the 150-50, um, we've got a question that is, did you look at uh, just straight 100-100 neutralization? Uh, oh, yes, yes. I mean, those, those are even better. Uh, but. I, I just figured that that probably wouldn't be very palatable to the investment community. <laughs> um, another another idea that I had was to actually, um, you know, make make the short exposure variable. Uh, 
you know the the position the position weights are evol all of, are evolving according to these behavioral metrics. But why don't we why don't we also make the the short exposure to to evolve as well? So so when there's just a ton of uh, short interest in the market, we're we're ramping up our our short exposure. That might be an interesting way to approach the strategies as well. Um, and I'm sorry, so one other point on the uh, cost of borrow score is that, so the 1 to 10 is based on a benchmark rate, which has a uh, variable look back depending on how many loans there are in the particular stock. Uh, but basically what it's doing is, try, is the underlying rate calculation is giving you a uh, smooth but best estimate of the borrow cost on a given day. And so, whereas the other zero to fives are based on straight as reported to us transactions, um, but this is something we could get into uh, with more detail as people are kind of looking at the strategies and uh, using those as using the cost scores as an overlay. Um, All right, great, um, John and Sam. Thank you both very much. Um, I Sam, it looks like you actually were able to weave in some of the questions from the audience over the last few minutes. Um, if there are any of you who uh, did not post questions or did not hear their question answered during the discussion, uh, we're happy to come back to you offline if you just send an email to webinars at dataexplorers.com. We will make sure that Sam and John get back to you. Also, there are quite a few questions about the availability of this presentation deck and um, the recorded webinar. We will make the webinar um, and slides available at dataexplorers.com forward slash research. Um, and again, if you'd like to make sure that you do get a copy, you could send an email to webinars at dataexplorers.com. And John, there, there have been a couple of questions about um, the availability of your paper, and I understand that um, it's, it's not yet been formally published, and this is a bit of a sneak peek, um, but fair to say that when it is published, it will be available for distribution to these uh, attendees on the webinar? Yes, indeed. I, I have a, a big backlog of projects that I have to, to finish before I start working on this again. Obviously, putting together all of this, um, all these slides took some time, so um, I, I don't want to put any any sort of deadline on it. But yeah, uh, it'll be available soon enough. Okay, great. And to those of you listening, um, we do have your contact details, so we'll make sure that um, that you're notified when the paper has been posted. And again, keep an eye out at www.dataexplorers.com forward slash research where the paper will eventually be posted. And until then, the webinar should be up in the next day or two. So thanks, everyone, and many thanks to Raven Pack for co-hosting the webinar. And we hope you have a good rest of the week.